the agency wants to get hired or the employee wants to get hired and you want the problem solved. That is the recipe for bad hiring. How do I get there? How do I change my mindset? Because it sounds like, and I've seen this a lot and I've seen this in, in myself. Sometimes I just tell myself, I don't know how to hire. I give up. Yes. I'm gonna make I'm not I'm gonna make a mistake again. Yes. So I'm there's different reactions to it. There's the people who I feel like blame the agency or the person that they try yes. to hire for not living up to the expectations. Mm -hmm. And then the ones who feel defeated and almost give up on hiring. Um, or they just go like with what you said, I'll hire four people and hope one sticks. <laughs> so from the mindset standpoint, from the moment that you decide I need to hire help with this until the day that that help is in your office helping you, that period of time is uncomfortable, right? You realize you have a need and that that need is costing you money and yet you haven't yet filled that need. And that uncomfortable time in between those two decisions um, is I think the source of a lot of our bad behavior in hiring. We wanna shorten that up. We want that help right now. And hiring, the process of hiring takes time. The, the old adage is fire fast, hire slow, right? And so that means that that time that we're going to have that uncomfortable feeling is going to be a while. And if you're a, if you're a, a, a business owner, if you run your own business and you fired that last person that wasn't performing, now you've got your job and their job and the job of doing hiring to do all at once. And so it's this painful process where I, you really do, you have too much to do. And so you want to get it done fast. The problem with getting it done fast is as each candidate comes in, you're thinking, can they solve my problem? Is this, the, is this the one? Is this the one that's gonna work? And so we're looking at each person, looking for the ways that they're signaling us that they're the right person. And the hiring, the person who's there to be hired is trying to give off all those signals, right? And so we're colluding together with the candidate or with the agency to, mutually deceive ourselves into thinking this is going to work because the agency wants to get hired or the employee wants to get hired and you want the problem solved. That is the recipe for bad hiring. A different way to do that would be to say, okay, as each candidate or as, as each agency comes in, I need to stand back and I need to look at these people critically and say, can they really solve the need that I want solved? And, and that means I'm not rushing to a solution. I'm actually taking my time to really evaluate, can they do this? So that's the mindset switch that I think makes a big difference. Going from, can they do it? Can they do it? Can they do it? To, I don't know, can they do it? What are the signals that are telling me that this might not work out? Does that make sense? Yeah, and so what you're saying is that it's okay to be unsure. Yes, absolutely. And that actually, in fact, forcing ourselves to feel sure may put us in some somewhat of a mental trap. Yes. And in fact, uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I, I recommend really long interviews. And one of my mm -hmm. clients was like, man, this long interview thing, Brad, it takes forever, but it's such a journey. Like that last person in the first five minutes, I loved him. And then 20 minutes into it, I thought this guy's never going to make it. And then an hour into it, I thought, oh, I see, maybe there's some pluses and minuses here, right? That's where we need to get to, right? Both the, he's for sure the right person and the, he's for sure not the right person. Those are us rushing to absolutes, to judgment. If we can get to that point, we're like, okay, I see the strengths and weaknesses here. We're more likely to make a good hire. I never thought of hiring as a journey, but when you think about it, your relationship with the agency or the, the employee is going to be a journey. Oh, for sure. So by forcing it to, for, by forcing them to prove themselves to us in those fi first five minutes, we're losing sight of the fact that they're not going to be with us for just five minutes or always <laughs> that person that they were during those five minutes. Last night, I was talking to a client who does web design. That's their primary uh, service offering. 
And they said, when we get a new client, we know that we're going to be working with these people for three to nine years. That's the length of client engagements. There are marriages shorter than that, right? And so like the idea that you're going to hire someone that you're going to work with for nearly a decade in a 15 minute phone call or even an hour presentation, like if, if, one of your friends was getting married after meeting somebody for an hour, wouldn't she be like, no, 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 this is not a good idea. <laughs> How do I get there? How do I change my mindset? Because it sounds like, and I've seen this a lot and I've seen this in, in myself. Sometimes I just tell myself, I don't know how to hire. I give up. Yes. I'm going to make, I'm not, I'm going to make a mistake again. Yes. So I'm, there's different reactions to it. There's the people who I feel like blame the agency or the person that they try yes. to hire for not, living up to the expectations mm -hmm. and then the ones who feel defeated and almost give up on hiring um, or they just go like with what you said I'll hire four people and hope one sticks <laughs> so from the mindset standpoint from the moment that you decide I need to hire help with this until the day that that help is in your office helping you that period of time is uncomfortable, right? You realize you have a need and that that need is costing you money and yet you haven't yet filled that need. And that uncomfortable time in between those two decisions um, is I think the source of a lot of our bad behavior in hiring. We wanna shorten that up. We want that help right now. And hiring, the process of hiring takes time. The, the old adage is fire fast, hire slow, right? And so that means that that time that we're going to have that uncomfortable feeling is going to be a while. And if you're, a, if you're a, a, a business owner, if you run your own business and you fired that last person that wasn't performing, now you've got your job and their job and the job of doing hiring to do all at once. And so it's this painful process where I, you really do, you have too much to do. And so you want to get it done fast. The problem with getting it done fast is as each candidate comes in, you're thinking, can they solve my problem? Is this the, is this the one? Is this the one that's going to work? And so we're looking at each person, looking for the ways that they're signaling us that they're the right person. And the hiring, the person who's there to be hired is trying to give off all those signals, right? And so we're colluding together with the candidate or with the agency to mutually deceive ourselves into thinking this is going to work because the agency wants to get hired or the employee wants to get hired and you want the problem solved. That is the recipe for bad hiring. A different way to do that would be to say, okay, as each candidate or as each agency comes in, I need to stand back. And I need to look at these people critically and say, can they really solve the need that I want solved? And, and that means I'm not rushing to a solution. I'm actually taking my time to really evaluate, can they do this? So that's the mindset switch that I think makes a big difference. Going from, can they do it? Can they do it? Can they do it? To, I don't know, can they do it? What are the signals that are telling me that this might not work out? Does that make sense? Yeah, and so what you're saying is that it's okay to be unsure. Yes, absolutely. And that actually, in fact, forcing ourselves to feel sure may put us in some somewhat of a mental trap. Yes, and in fact, uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I, I recommend really long interviews. And one of mm -hmm. my clients was like, man, this long interview thing, Brad, it takes forever, but it's such a journey. Like." That last person in the first five minutes, I loved him. And then 20 minutes into it, I thought this guy's never going to make it. And then an hour into it, I thought, oh, I see, maybe there's some pluses and minuses here, right? That's where we need to get to, right? Both the he's for sure the right person and the he's for sure not the right person. Those are us rushing to absolutes, to judgment. If we can get to that point, we're like, okay, I see the strengths and weaknesses here we're more likely to make a good hire. I never thought of hiring as a journey, but when you think about it, your relationship with the agency or the, the employee is going to be a journey. Oh, for sure. 
So by forcing it to, by forcing them to prove themselves to us in those five, first five minutes, we're losing sight of the fact that they're not going to be with us for just five minutes or always <laughs> that person that they were during those five minutes. Last night, I was talking to a client who does web design. That's their primary uh, service offering. And they said, when we get a new client, we know that we're going to be working with these people for three to nine years. That's the length of client engagements. There are marriages shorter than that, right? And so like the idea that you're going to hire someone that you're going to work with for nearly a decade in a 15 minute phone call, or even an hour presentation, like if, if, one of your friends was getting married after meeting somebody for an hour, wouldn't you be like, no, 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 this is not a good idea. <laughs> it sounds to me like we also need to focus on discipline. Actually, I'm hearing a couple of things. One, if I don't know what I want, it's going to be really hard to find that mm. hire. It's so important to be really clear about what you want. Now, as an agency, when companies come to me, I ask them the, you know, five, why five times uh -huh. to really get to what their true needs are because it's very easy to come in and say, we want social media. Mm -hmm. Right, but why? Yeah. Um, and we, we, it's painful at times, but we dig a little deeper into mm -hmm. that. It's very interesting to me that we, take, we don't take the same approach when we hire employees. If we go to an agency, they're going to force us to express our big why. The good agencies will, <laughs> as uncomfortable as may be. Yep. When, you, when we hire employees, they, they don't feel free to dig into our big right. why. That's right. So it's really important that we, we take that time up front before we even write the job description to really think what we truly need um, and what person would be a good fit for our team and our culture and so on. Yeah, I just want to throw one thing in there. When you're hiring employees, the job posting is critical. In the same way that you wouldn't post your, your product brochure as you know, an advertising to get someone to, to buy your product, posting your job description on a, on a job board is not the right solution. A job posting is designed to attract your ideal um, employee. And so you want to talk about who that person is and why they're right for this job and what the challenges are that they're going to be able to engage in. And if they conquer those challenges, what the rewards are going to be, right? You want them to be the hero of the job posting so that you attract people who really want that challenge. And it should be the same with an agency, right? Yes, so for sure. With agencies, the process usually starts with an RFP or with a request for proposal. And that in itself kind of derails us from, right. from that journey. Yeah, that's sort of like posting your job posting, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of those RFPs is like copying a job posting from somebody else yes. and, and using it as your own. A lot yeah. of these RFPs are, are the same way. So, Brad, yeah. what's a better way to do this? So we talked about how to do it in when you hire an employee. What's a better way to hire an agency? When I am going to hire an agency, what I want to say first is what is the outcome I'm looking for? This is the thing that I want to have improved. This is what it's going to look like. If we work together and we achieve success, it's going to look like this. And then I want to go ahead and say, here are the obstacles to getting there. You know, we've tried this and it didn't work. We don't have this, you know, our budget is this. Um, I, I know you're going to want to see these tools. We don't have those tools. You know, internally, we have a, our decision making processes like this. I want to let them know what are the challenges that they need to overcome in order to, to accomplish that. And then I want to hear from them other situations in which they've encountered similar challenges and gotten a result like we're looking for. Right. And so mm -hmm. instead of doing an RFP, I want to I want to kind of open the kimono and tell them what they're getting into and then just let them come in and say, OK, given that, here's the approach that we would look at. Here's what we would see. The other thing that I like in hiring an agency is not to, you know, maybe the agencies aren't going to like me for saying this, but the first thing you sign shouldn't be a one year retainer. Right. Let, let, let's not jump right into the marriage. Let's do some dating like. <laughs> Here's a project maybe we should start with, or maybe there's an evaluation phase where, where I need to pay you a little bit of money to get you to look at the problem in more detail, because I expect that the expert is going to see things that I'm not going to see. And I want to hear that from the agency. I don't want them to pair it back to me. Oh yeah, that's exactly the right project or tactic or whatever. 
I want them to say, well, you consider this and what about this? And look, you do have some assets here that, that you aren't telling us about. Like, I want to give them a chance to pull all that together for me. So a key thing here is if you're going to hire an agency, don't hire a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. exactly right. From the flip side, by the way, I don't hate you for having said that because we don't have <laughs> one year long retainers. So I've already learned that lesson. <laughs> but um, from the agency perspective, where I see breakdowns is when there's when we don't account for enough communication and collaboration time. Mm -hmm. So if you come in with a very small budget, we're going to do the work, but we don't, we're not going to have the time to fully collaborate and communicate appropriately. And then the client is going to start feeling like, like they're, they're not getting the appropriate, appropriate amount of time and attention from us. And so we don't want a situation like that. Uh, we want to have ample time. And just like when you hire an employee, I want to feel like we're going to thrive. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to think that it's going to be easy because it's never easy. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. Digital marketing takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication, a lot of thinking time. Um, but I want this, I want when we start talking about the collaboration, the relationship we're going to have as client and agency, I want to get this feeling like, oh my, I can't, I, I can help them. I'm so excited to help yes. them. And we're both going to thrive. Yeah. If I don't have ample time to communicate with you, we're not going to thrive. Just yeah. like you, you gave the example of a marriage, yeah. you need communication, right? Um, so that's my perspective on what some of the failure points are there. And I can pinpoint it in the interview process as an agency. If we're not collaborating from the beginning of that RFP process, let's say, if I just have to submit something in, in response to the RFP, it's not a collaboration. And then I'm a little skeptical about the, the, the long-term potential of this, of this relationship. So, so far we've focused on the hiring manager side. I do want to change sides of the table briefly because some of the issues that you just brought up, I really want to pin on the agencies. And the first where you said the budget doesn't include enough time for communication and, and collaboration, the agencies need to budget that in what they're offering. And if you start splitting that out and put account management hours and the creative hours separately and hours in general is a bad idea, but, but to the extent that you're separating those things out, you're asking your prospects or your clients to take aim at those account management hours and try to squeeze them down. Don't do that. You know you need that. And so put it all together. This project is going to cost X. If, 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 there's not a val if X is not a value for this project, then we shouldn't do it, right? We shouldn't, we shouldn't try to skinny things down to sneak into a budget because now we're setting ourselves both sides up to not be successful. Yeah, um, you taught me a very, a very smart way as part of conversation. I feel like a lot of what I've learned from you is how to say things, to to have better communication mm -hmm. with with my prospects, so that it's a win win for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so one of the phrases that you've taught me is, um, "What would happen if?" And in that conversation, we can say, what would happen if we don't set aside enough time for right. communication and collaboration? Right. Um, so you know, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, you, you put a price on it and then you say, well, this is what it's going to take. Are you committed to success? Mm -hmm. At the same time, that's the simplified version, right? As yes. part of that conversation, yeah. it is important to raise some questions like, what would happen if we don't do it the right way? That's right. That's right. And another way, another thing that I think falls under that communication thing is when you're pitching, and this is true whether you're uh, interviewing as an employee or as an agency, if you're in the interview process or you're, you're meeting with the prospect and you're starting to get that feeling like, ooh, I think this budget isn't really enough to get this work done. Instead of hiding that inside and then going back and making a tiny little budget that you, that you know isn't going to be successful, it's way better to stop right there and say, you know, in my experience, a project like this is going to take a budget of Y, and you're only talking about a budget of X. 
Is there flexibility in that budget? Because at a budget of X, I think we should talk about a whole different approach, right? And so to, to, if, if inside you're thinking, I'm seeing a problem, it's on you to put that on the table earlier rather than later. Why would you invest more time if you find out that it's a situation you're not gonna be successful in? Yeah, it's very interesting to me how we're talking about hiring in both instances or even hiring a consultant, yet there's such different approaches to hiring an employee versus hiring an agent. Yes. <laughs> so I want to go back to something that I think the two do have in common, and that's that concept of discipline. Mm -hmm. Every time you've taught me these processes and you have a toolbox and toolkit, we're going to put the link in the description. Um, I recommend everybody check that out. So you've shared these resources with me years ago, and you continue to do so as my mm -hmm. advisor. And Every time I fail, it's because I don't have the discipline to stick to the process or the discipline to do that long interview because yes. it's painful. It's yes. an hour and a, it may take an hour and a half yes. and it's painful to go through it and yes. I'm busy. Right. So what do you advise those who hire, whether it's an agency or a consultant or an employee, how do I practice this discipline? What do I need so that I don't, because what I see a lot happening and I do this a lot is, sure, I have all the tools, but then I don't use them. Yes. So I want to tell you how I learned this lesson because I don't come upon this, like this isn't natural for me. I, when I first built this long interview guide and built this whole process, I knew it was a best practice, but over time I kept trying to find shortcuts. I'd be like, oh, well, we can take this question out or we can skip this part of the interview. And every time I did that, it would bite me in the butt. Every time I did that, I would get to the point of hiring and I'd think, I don't have this piece of information that I need, or I'm making an assumption about this thing instead of listening to what the candidate said. And so eventually I, I realized I give up, like I have to ask all the questions. And that's a really tr tricky part of the process that again, we're five minutes in and we're like, oh, this person is a disaster. <laughs> I want to just cut the interview and, and split. But what I've learned is if I keep going, I find out that there's a later, later part of the interview where that person shines, right? And so by taking the time and asking all the questions, and remember, we're keeping that mindset of we're being skeptical. And so the other re way we take shortcuts is that we start making assumptions. Oh, well, he's worked in a big agency. He knows all about account management. Tell me about your experience with account management ask every question and then listen to the answer that they give because you do need all of the information. Um, again, getting back to the, to the, to the gambling analogy, um, would you want to play poker if you only got to see two of the cards that were up and everybody else got to see four of the cards that were up? No, you need all the information that you can to, to understand the situation that you're in. And so slowing down and asking all the questions and going through the steps and not skipping to the end really makes for a better hiring process. Another, another good example is sometimes people will skip the second interview. The second interview is a place where the candidate gets to ask you more questions, where they're feeling a little more comfortable. And so if you skip and, and make an offer after just the first interview, a lot of times you have candidates that will skip out on you because they, they aren't ready yet. They don't know if this is the right situation for them. And so really the, the whole, you need every step. I wish it wasn't true. I really, really wish there was a better way, but you need every step. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and it's true in a lot of instances. One of the most interesting questions I added to my questionnaires that came from a now client at the time it was a prospect. They asked me, is there something I didn't ask that I should have asked? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I find it so revealing when I ask that question of candidates um, when I hire. So, also, when you're hiring an agency, that's a really good question to ask. Uh, or on the other side, if you are the agency, is there something I should have asked that I, that I didn't? Yeah. Those are yeah. those, it, it just, it opens the door to say, you know, spill a little bit. What, what, what's going on? Let's here, get right? real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Brad, is there something I should have asked that I haven't asked? <laughs> uh, 
Um, when you're hiring an employee, I think the other thing we haven't talked about is compensation. Um, the trend right now is not to put compensation in a job posting, but I can tell you if you add compensation to the job posting, you'll get more applicants and more of them will be qualified. When you don't put um, a salary range in the job posting, especially the more qualified or more senior candidates feel like it's probably not for them, right? Like you're not going to pay them. It's not. And so you tend to attract a lower quality, lower paid yeah. group of candidates. Yeah. The same thing is true when you're hiring an agency. You need to know about what it's going to cost to do this. They're going to ask you what your budget is. Have a number. It's okay to give them a budget. It really is. If you give them a budget, you're more likely to have that an important conversation about, you know, I think that's not enough. Or, wow, with that kind of budget, we could do a lot more. Like, you're going to get into a better conversation with more of the right people. I love that. Um, how, what do you think about, how do you feel about this? I've noticed in the past year, talking about compensation, um, I do my own weird type of research where to understand my potential clients a little bit better, I go and look at their job postings. Mm -hmm and see what language they use for, for marketing needs that they have and so on. And just in general, it also gives me topics for the mana minutes and so on. <laughs> and so it's my own little type of research that I recommend everybody do. Looking at job posts is not just if you're looking for a job. Good point. You can give a lot, as an agency, you can give a lot of insights into how companies think about what they need. But I've noticed this trend in the past year that to me is just insane. Job uh, uh, co compensation ranges for a marketing director role that says the range will say 50,000 to 150,000. Yeah, yeah, that's just not, they, that's not what is option. going on there. No, that's that's people that are afraid to put a number down. Um, I mean, I want to have a range, I'm not gonna say the salary is $103,419, that's crazy. Um, but it's got to be within a 30 percent band, you know. If you want to say 85 to 105, like that's fine. But yeah, 50 to 150 is insane. They don't know what, what they're communicating to the market is they don't know what they want. Yeah, because you're basically saying, I'll take somebody junior. I'll take someone right out of school or someone with yeah. 10 years experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So don't do that. Right. <laughs> and again, that ties back to what we talked about earlier. You have to know what you need. The, the real big why you're you're needing this. So if we were to to summarize, what are the top three things you should focus on when you're hiring? Number one, know what you're looking for. What is the problem that you want to solve? What are the skills and behaviors of a person who is most likely to solve that problem? And what are the challenges and opportunities that come to the job? All of that needs to be in the job posting. That's number one. Number two, don't rush. Take your time. Be critical. Slow things down. Number three, uh, number three would be be disciplined. Follow the whole process. I mean, that kind of goes with don't be in a rush, but following the whole process, not making assumptions is, is, is a really key factor. And the thing is, it's one of those things that you only experience if you do it. Like, if you, if you ask the question that you think you know the answer to, and then they say something else, you're like, oh, that was not the answer that I thought they were going to give me. <laughs> so give it a try. Ask all the questions. See what happens. Awesome. Let's do a quick exercise. Sure. What is, what is one mistake you've seen me make, and then I fix later on, and what did we both learn from it? You go first. <laughs> Around hiring? Yes. So uh, a mistake that you made and that I see a lot of clients make is that um, they had a picture in their mind of what their ideal candidate looked like. And by looked like, I mean how they dressed, what kind of hair they had, their age and gender and some of those kind of things. And so that when, the, and I'm not saying that they were discriminating, I'm just saying that when that person walked in that was a shortcut to this is the right answer, right? This person looks like the kind of candidate that I would want to hire. A, 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 a great example of this in the public sphere is um, Trump kept hiring 
uh, people to run the Department of Defense who looked like generals, right? That he he would say that you know this person looks like they're right out of central casting for a general, and and that's that shortcut that our brain is making that this is the right person. Do you, do you agree that you used to make that mistake? Yeah, I think so because yeah. I think it was such a typical right thing that I a lesson I learned from the corporate world. Right, it was that. I mean, in my first few years working in the corporate world in banking, I had to wear a suit That's right? Right. every day. And then years later, they introduced jeans in the on a Friday right. or something like that. Because, and as you know, a woman if you wear too, jeans I, on a Thursday, your stock price plummets. It's it's a proven yes, fact. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so so yeah. So when I started my company, I I brought in a lot of these corporate. Uh, ways of doing things that were not necessarily productive for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that as the world turned and we do more interviews like this in long distance, that became less of a factor. Yep. Yeah. And I also think that as you slowed down and started listening to answers, that person that looked like the right candidate started giving you the wrong answers. And then that helps you just kind of question that assumption that that's the right person, right? Yeah, yeah. And I will never forget when that switch flipped, when you gave us the template for the questionnaire in the interview. And I said, you know, I'm actually not great at this. And I know that my discipline is not, not right there. Let me have my VP of operations lead this and I will come in later in the process. And she was very structured and went through every single question with every single candidate. And then everything turned around for us. So this is a great, great place to mention that that exact hiring checklist is in the toolbox that the link in the, in the description below is going to take you right to that, that toolbox and you can download that same toolbox for yourself. Awesome. So the people can also have that switch flip for them. That's right. I love <laughs> Another one, let's, let's do this exercise again. Yep. As an agency owner, yes. what, is a, what is the mistake you've seen me make in striking deals so i'm not the one being hired what is one of the mistakes you've seen me made that i was able to turn around and how do you, how do we turn them around uh i would say and again this is a very common mistake that i see from a lot of of agency owners um there's a point in the wooing process with a with a prospect where you've already decided that they're going to hire from you right like this is a done deal in your mind. And objections that come up after that, I feel like you've tended to cave on those, right? Like once it's a done deal in your mind, losing it, there's an emotional attachment to losing it. And so, so your negotiating leverage goes down. And I have seen more recently that you have not been doing that, that you're, you're less attached to those deals because you've found yourself in some bad deals, right? <laughs> that when we cave late in the process, then we end up in situations where we can't be successful. And I think at this point, your desire to be successful is greater than your desire to be liked by those people. Yeah. Yeah. And that is very common. And I take full responsibility for it. And I think that's important for everybody to know is that we we are in control of our out, own outcomes when it comes to who we choose to work with and not. Um, and I've always said that there were times when I lost a bad client and the moment that happened, I got three good yes. clients and yes. replace them. That's amazing. Isn't um, it? Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a, it's a real thing. It so, is a real thing. <laughs> so trust, trust that process. And I'm lucky to have you and our advisory group, the group that you're leading and everybody in the group keeps me accountable, which is probably why you've seen that change because yep. I have help. So the yep. other thing that I want to advise agencies to do, um, or even freelancers want to bring on help, um, is to find your people, find your tribe, find yeah. those who will hold you accountable and be honest with you and not just tell you because of the worst things that have happened to me were when people are just like, Mana, you're doing great, you're awesome. And I'm like, I don't really <laughs> believe you're a liar. <laughs> you are a liar because I am not perfect. And right now I need the raw truth. So surround yourself with people who can help you grow by being honest with you about the changes you need to make. And you always have these tools, Brad, you can find, where can they find you, Brad? 
Uh, anchoradvisors.com is the best place to find me. Um, if you're an agency, right on the homepage, there's an assessment there that'll help you to identify where you are in the growth journey and give you some tips about the next steps that you might want to take. And, uh, you know, down below that hiring toolkit is a great place for you to get started to improve your hiring. Yeah, we're going to put all the links there so that you can find Brad and access. also check out his LinkedIn. He, he posts really cool stuff on there. Very, very thoughtful. Thanks. So I like it as a, as a just reading to trigger ideas for me as well. So thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me, Mona. This has been fun. This was so great. Yeah. And I like that your LinkedIn tagline ends with you can do it or let's do it. What does it say? I think it says you Let can do it. Yeah. You can do it, right? Because you can. Yeah. <laughs>